Thank you for joining us. You are a part of a powerful group who recognizes that black women's health should be at the forefront of the national conversation. We are mothers, daughters, activists, entrepreneurs, entertainers, corporate warriors, and more who help boost the economy and often drive the national conversation. For almost 40 years, the Black Women's Health Imperative has strived to amplify our voices, help enact policy that protects us, research our issues, create programs that enhance our lives, and produce events like this one to ensure we keep the conversation going about the issues that matter to us most. So let's get started with our program. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Diversity and Cultural Competency in Research webinar. Um, the Black Women's Health Imperative launched the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition with the goal to address the extraordinary challenges faced by rare disease patients of color. So the RDDC brings together rare disease um, experts, health and diversity advocates, and industry leaders who identified an advocate for evidence-based solution to alleviate the disproportionately burden of rare disease on the communities of color. And my name is Agnes Costello. I will be your moderator for today's session. And I would like to take the opportunity to invite um, our esteemed panel to come on. Um, they will introduce themselves and give, them a, give you a little bit of background of why they're involved and what's important to them. So the, I'm gonna introduce um, Hasha um, Rajasima, he's the founder and CEO of Java Informatic Solution. He's also the founder and executive chair of Indo-US Organization for Rare Disease. Welcome. Thank you, Agnes. Good to be here. Would you like to give um, um, the audience just a brief background about who you are and why you're involved in this? Absolutely. Um, initiative? Absolutely. Um, so as a social uh, entrepreneur involved in rare disease for the last 10 years, my professional background is in genomics and data science. Um, working at uh, Jiva Informatics, we are addressing unmet needs for uh, people uh, involved with clinical trials to access them irrespective of their geographic location, uh, race, gender, ethnicity, and other uh, diversity parameters. Uh, at Indo-US organization, we are bridging gaps uh, on a global level um, to address the massive inequities that exist in rare disease research, as 90% of research uh, happens in the Western world, with the Indian subcontinent being uh, um, not as included uh, in clinical research. Um, so at a personal level, I'm connected to rare disease, um, as I had a child born with a Edward syndrome which uh, my fellow speaker today, Ed, uh, Sarita, is uh, going to uh, be uh, advocating and talking about in particular. But uh, the scope of my work has been broader uh, on all rare disease uh, related uh, challenges. Wonderful, I'm looking forward to hearing more from you. And our next um, panelist is Dr. Tia Robertson. She's the medical director from the Gaston County Public Health um, Obstetric and Gynecologist. Welcome. Welcome. Um, Agnes, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation to participate on this panel. Um, as a medical director for a county of about 230,000 uh, people, it's my role to ensure the uh, positive outcomes for uh, various health issues, um, especially concerning um, rare disease in our area. Uh, my career in healthcare extends through, um, extend well, it begins with uh, research, clinical research, looking at uh, genetics in, in African-American men, actually. And um, throughout my medical career, I've had a special interest in health literacy and the patient-physician relationship, which I believe is extremely imperative and important when we're looking at rare disease and how it affects um, our uh, minority population. Wonderful. Looking forward to hearing more. Thank you for participating. Our next speaker is Sarita Edwards. She's the CEO and president of WWE Foundation. Welcome, Sarita. Thank you so much. Um, Sarita Edwards, I am CEO and president at the EWE Foundation. We facilitate resources and support for families living with Edwards syndrome or trisomy 18 um, and other rare diseases. I'm also a parent advocate. My husband and I, we have five children. Our youngest, Elijah, was diagnosed in utero 
with full trisomy 18. I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Welcome, welcome. And our last panelist, but not least, um, Dr. Martine Hackett, I'm Associate Professor and Director, Public Health Programs, Hofstra University, and she's also the Chair in Population Health. Welcome. I'm uh, happy to be here uh, with this esteemed panel. And my background is as a researcher and uh, public health uh, professional, specifically working with communities. I uh, used to work at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in uh, maternal and child health. And so working with communities, community-based participatory research, and working to be able to uh, engage communities in uh, the process of research is my background. So thrilled to be here. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. So I'm going to start with a, with a general topic. And I think I'm going to ask, um, you know, the youth population now is relatively diverse. There's many different ethics groups, different cultural groups. But yet, despite the these differences, this diverse group, there's relatively limited participation of these groups in clinical trials, especially in rare diseases. So I would like to understand from, I think I would start with Sarita first, like from a patient perspective, why do you think that is? Can you elaborate and share maybe some experience why um, there's a lack of representation of diverse um, and diverse cultural and ethnic backgrounds in clinical trials participation in the US? Um, really good question. You know, personally, I think, I think, I think we have challenges when it comes to participation, um, you know, from the patient communities, I think um, a lot of it is just not understanding what clinical trials are and um, um, and how crucial um, participating in clinical trials can benefit patient communities. Um, I also think a lot of it is um, not trusting the healthcare system, the healthcare space, and 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 sometimes that creates. Um, hesitancy to want to participate in clinical trials. Um, I also think, you know, some of it is not being asked to participate, not knowing that clinical trials ex exist um, and are available for, for patients to be involved in. Um, I think specifically when we talk about the rare disease community, um, there aren't a lot of clinical trials because these um, these diseases are rare. These conditions are rare. And, and, and for a lot of them, no one is looking at them um, to offer clinical trials. So I think, you know, I think there are a lot of different vari variables to why patients don't participate. Um, but I think it starts with having more conversations um, and creating opportunities for patients to understand the value of clinical trials and, and trying to, to uh, reestablish what may be creating their hesitancy to participate. Um, I think we just ha we have to talk about it more so all the key stakeholders involved understand why we, we want to, to be in the space of clinical trials and having those conversations. So I think there's a lot of different reasons why patients may or may not want to um, participate, mm -hmm. but I, I think a lot of it starts with a lack of conversation. So th that's that's a great perspective. And I'm going to ask um, Dr. Robertson to kind of address that as, as a physician, you know, boots on the ground. Um, do you think there is some re reason why patients are not, patients of diverse background and cultural backgrounds, you know, from what we hear from Sarita, are not offer a clinical trial? Like, were there some hesitancy in that or assumptions made? You know, um, this is a very interesting question and has many layers to it. Uh, really, from my perspective, what we find in clinical practice um, is that, um, for one, you have your clinical flow for your day-to-day -day activities. And sometimes you don't have time to stop and talk about different research opportunities or clinical trials. Um, and that's one issue that a lot of physicians face on a day-to-day -day basis. The other would be that um, there may be a lack of cultural competency in understanding where to meet the patient um, and helping them to understand the, the clinical trial and the risk and benefits of the clinical trial. So my advice would be to incorporate cultural competency training for physicians at every level of education in medical school and residency, as well as once they get to their designated 
uh, a corporation or hospital or private practice where they're working because um, if you aren't, if you don't understand the culture for different minority groups, it's very difficult to understand their hesitancy. It's very in difficult to understand the barriers, all, even the barriers there that they may face, you know, travel issues, or um, they may be dealing with more basic issues like food insecurities or um, shelter issues, social determinants of health. And, and they may, and because of those issues, uh, a clinical trial might not be something that's, that's uh, at the forefront of their mind mm -hmm. at the time because you're focused on the basic survival skills. So understanding where your patients are, meeting them where they are, is the first step to opening up the communication. Um, Sarita mentioned earlier, communication is key and I agree with that. Um, if you don't start the conversation, your patients won't be able to have the information they need to make informed decisions. Oh, that's great. That's a really good point. Um, a lot to take, a lot to digest and, and take home, actually. Um, I want to kind of ask um, Hasha, like his perspective from a patient and also the leader of the Indo-US organization for, for, for rare disease. From representing patients, what would you like clinicians to hear when it comes to clinical trial? Um, what would you like to highlight for them to understand? And what are some of the key elements you think are important to incorporate into their training? Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's uh, several uh, reasons and uh, aspects here, Agnes, uh, like Sarita and uh, Tia mentioned already. But mm -hmm. uh, a few few other aspects that I like to highlight are one, um, both for rare and common indications over uh, historically, 80% uh, of clinical trial participants have been Caucasian, mostly male, adult from affluent socioeconomic backgrounds. And that's across the board for all diseases and all phases of clinical trials, right? That's the average. And that hasn't changed even as late as the COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials. And so it's been such a persistent issue and that has now become the top priority for the new FDA commissioner who has made um, inclusion of uh, underrepresented minorities a, a key priority. Now, when you look at the underrepresentation of uh, Asians, uh, for example, uh, they form a minority population in the United States. But when you look at it on a global scale, they represent half of the world's population, right? And so uh, while we may have enough representation uh, proportional to the US population, uh, it, it's not, uh, still significantly disproportionate when you look at the global population of uh, certain underrepresented minorities. Uh, so that's important to uh, recognize. The second is there is uh, these clinical trials are often conducted in academic medical centers that are uh, concentrated in Boston, Bay Area, uh, Bethesda, Houston. And so a uh, vast majority of uh, people living um, and accessing healthcare at community health centers are still not even have a option of uh, learning about or ever hearing about a clinical trial. That's uh, that's a huge challenge, and and you know there is a whole notion of clinical research as a care option has not yet become a reality. You know, uh, and that that's uh, the, the second key aspect uh, is the geographic distribution and the location of the sites. And the third is uh, clinical research is increasingly data driven, and uh, so if patients are not already in these databases, whether it's electronic medical records that are being uh, mined. Uh, to uh, identify potential eligible patients, they, they just don't exist uh, when, when it comes to clinical trials. So it's still a very top-down approach of a sponsor mm -hmm. recruiting site investigators and the sites pulling in patients from the communities that they serve. And so mm -hmm. unless we reach out to the community and have these patients identifiable, they, there is the conversation can't even begin. And, and that's what Sarita mm -hmm. is mentioning is the conversations are not happening enough mm -hmm. to begin with. No, I think that's a really good point. What I'm hearing is it's really about outreach and community and generating awareness of the clinical trial as a foundation on top of the cultural competency training from a physician perspective. With that, I think it's a good segue for me to ask Martine to kind of maybe share her public health expertise um, or past experience about how do we, you know, engage the community more to increase awareness, especially in these, you know, diverse social economic, um, uh, social um, 
diverse groups or geographic area. I mean, I'll correct myself, more like a, the, the diverse geographic areas. How do we pull those in to increase awareness, especially in rare disease where patients can be all over? So I think we have a great lesson to learn with COVID-19. Um, I think one of the things that we saw when the vaccine um, was first being developed was that there was hesitancy um, across many populations, but in particularly in minoritized communities. And there are valid reasons why there was a lack of trust based on sort of on history, on uh, the systematic racism, on the uh, idea of uh, health disparities that currently exist. Um, and so I think what we learned is that that, um, trusted messengers, first of all, was one uh, a great way for people to understand and to build the trust about what's in this vaccine. What are the ways that these are being developed? What are the possible risks? Um, and it turns out that those trusted messengers within who are in many cases were from or respected by the communities that were um, had some lack of confidence actually was able to turn around and to increase the number of vaccines and the compliance with the vaccines. And so I think that really, you know, straightforward lesson um, from recent history shows us that in order to be able to get that sort of um, shift to participation, you have to have the patients to be able to build that level of trust. And you have to have the right people doing that outreach. No, I think I I think it resonates to all of us and some of the key points that we discussed. But I also, you know, when you talk about, you know, building that trust, designing the clinical trials, I want to ask um, Dr. Robertson, like, as a researcher, as a clinician, if you were designing trial, what are some of the things you would teach your colleague or share with your colleagues or, you know, those in training to incorporate cultural, cultural competency or unique aspect of the diverse patients in the clinical trials so that we can pull them in and have them as um, partners from the from the beginning. Do you have some thoughts about that? Sure, absolutely. You know, the most important thing is to incorporate principal investigators that are diverse. So if you get a diverse group of principal investigators, then to speak to uh, Martine's point about trusted messengers, then they mm -hmm. will be the trusted messenger in the community. Because, um, and I can speak from experience here, back in the early 2000s, I was part of the African American Hereditary Prostate Cancer Study Network. And it was a study network that consisted of seven different sites across the country where most of the, of the principal investigators were African American. And the goal was to investigate the genetics in families that had a history, a prominent history of, of prostate cancer. So we had to recruit African-American men to participate in the study and we drew blood and sent it off. And back in the early 2000s, that was a big deal to share your genetics and be an African-American male considering the history, um, especially with the Tuskegee experiment. But we were able to recruit about 77 families across the nation to participate. And that was largely due to the fact that the study was uh, championed by principal investigators that look like the people they are trying to recruit. So that would be my suggestion would be to look at mm -hmm. your principal investigators and extend your reach um, mm -hmm. to a more diverse group of people. No, that's a really good point, right? It's, it's estab understanding the culture as well and then establishing that trust. Um, but from a patient perspective, Sarita, what do you want investigators or drug developers developing drugs for rare disease to hear to incorporate that um, cultural and diverse background? Do you have any experience you want to share or some insights um, that in um, sponsors and that they should consider when they're designing clinical trials. Like what are some of the patient perspective you want them to hear and to understand? You know, I think as far as what I've heard, I've heard patient communities talk about um, they want to know, you know, how the information is being used. They want to know who is being shared with. They want to know the progression of the of the the trial. You know, a lot of times I think patients feel like they're given their information and then they're not receiving any follow up. Um, you know, I've heard some patients. You know, 
they want to be compensated for their time. I've heard other patients not want to be compensated. You know, they feel like it's a due diligence type of thing. Um, you know, for me personally, I think I think it starts with, I agree with Dr. Robertson, I think it starts with, um, you know, understanding the communities that you're trying to serve and have that representation on that team. Um, but I also think it's important for patients to be involved in the clinical framework design. I think, you know, mm -hmm. I think when we're designing um, these projects, um, we, we want to make sure we have patient perspective included somewhere. So when, when outcomes are being shared with those communities who've decided to participate, they feel like they've received something that they expected rather than they participated and nothing that was done really benefited them. Um, I think it's also important too to, to remove the assumption that um, if you go into these communities um, properly, that patients are going to respond. I think, you know, that there's that's not going to always be the case. You know, I've heard patients feel insulted um, um, to be offered a gift card to participate in a clinical trial. And so I think, I think it really just starts with, with having patients, um, in that, in that design study, in, in the, in the beginning phases of the conversation. So you will know some level of outreach, um, um, when you step into these communities, because I mean, you know, let's be honest, patients are, are not afraid to say no, um, and, and I believe, um, they're, they're more okay to say no to people who look like them and, and they'll, they're more open to give those reasons why. And so I think we have to, to just remove all assumptions of, of, of knowing what patients want, because a lot of times we're wrong. Um, and the only way to remove that is to have their voice in the, in the beginning phases of the, of the projects. Yeah, what I'm hearing is it's more like engage patients early, let them speak, let's listen, let's develop a partnership with them. Um, you know, it's 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 easier said. I think there's challenges in Roblox to do that, and I think it part of the the reason we're having this conversation is just to at least listen and having the awareness, and then we take them step by step, as as Dr. Robertson has mentioned, you know, peel off the the, the layers so that we can kind of tackle one problem at a time. But I, I want to ask um, Hasha this question, so building on what um, both panelists have mentioned. You know, they talk about investigators um, as, as principal investigators. We talk about engaging patients early. From your perspective, you know, you have to, you have a child with with rare disease. Like, how do you and with your work with the Indo Group, um, Indo um, U.S. Organization for Rare Disease, how do you tell study sponsors to develop drugs? for a diverse group of patients or a specific, or maybe a rare disease that uniquely affect um, a certain um, population. Do you have any experience that you want to share, like, or thoughts that you want to share? Absolutely. You know, for rare diseases in particular, uh, a, much, a lot of this begins with a patient registry, natural history study, uh, because these uh, are not as well studied and well published in scientific literature. So uh, there's not as much data as some of the common indications might have. And so they, uh, the sponsors are relying upon existing patient registries and natural history study databases uh, where data is curated over a period of time to understand the natural progression of the disease in a heterogeneous group of patients. And so it's it's very critical to have that good starting point of these registries that are representative of the general population uh, that the disease might affect. You know, there are certain diseases that are predominantly race and ethnicity driven, um, like cystic fibrosis, and there are others um, uh, like sickle cell disease as well, where it, it, you have to uh, understand where, what's the target population like. And uh, then, uh, you know, take into account the logistical burdens for these patients to enroll and participate in a clinical trial and complete them, um, like the burden of having to travel to a clinical trial site. Uh, wh where should we have the site selected? And two, uh, what's the frequency of travel for these patients and families? Often, the patient may need to be accompanied by a caregiver who may need to take time off their work. And, and so, can... Is there a need to compensate for these families, not just to reimburse their 
actual travel expenses, but also these indirect costs that might be associated with participating in this trial. And uh, there is also FDA listening sessions uh, where these uh, sponsors can also be involved in uh, openly and publicly uh, listening and understanding what uh, are mm -hmm. the key challenges for that particular rare disease community. Uh, these are very critical uh, and these have to start way before even a clinical trial is a couple of years down the road. Um, these activities have to be happening. Yeah, it sounds like we're really from, from many different levels, from the patient, industry, investigators. Um, we all need to work together from the ground up to in order for a successful finding a successful therapy for rare diseases um, involving all parties. Now, I have a, actually a question from the um, from the audience that kind of fits well into, as we expand, when we have a clinical trials, we do our homework, right? We have this what, with this trial with everybody's input. One of the one of the questions I think resonates, to, um, and I think Martine can help address is maybe share some strategies that we all know rare disease. The patients are all over. They, but a lot of times only the, um, the center of excellence or academic centers treat these patients in rare disease. So how do we inform community physicians um, about potential for these clinical trials and refer them to these academic center? And also from my past experience as well, as a researcher, as also as a sponsor, a lot of times patients are not comfortable going to a center of excellence. They have developed a good relationship with a local physician. So the question is really about how do we increase awareness of these studies available in these different geographic areas and how do we inform physicians who are willing to, you know, um, send them to these academic centers? So I'm thinking of a couple of things here. One is the difference between something being community placed and community based. And I think that, you know, the idea of just having something, you know, available doesn't necessarily mean that it's accessible. And so I think what we're, we have to recognize is that the, uh, the, when we talk about engaging community, that it really is sort of, um, as has been mentioned, uh, you know, a, a, an effort that takes patience and time. And so in order to do that, that really means sort of, not necessarily going to where you are or starting where you are, but going to where people are. And so to be able to do that, that means in building, that's one step in terms of building that trust. The other thing I'm thinking about in terms of the awareness, and I'm sure um, Sarita can talk about this, is the rare patient community and the communications that are already happening peer to peer. And so how is it that we can, again, use a, a trusted messenger? In public health, there's a, a very um, well-known model called the community health worker model that uh, engages people from from a community to be able to educate and inform people within that same community. And what that model does is that it sort of breaks down all of those different levels and, and allows for more authentic communication. And so I would suggest that the ability to sort of take that model, that sort of uh, community health worker model, it, to engage people who are already in the rare disease community, to talk to others um, based on that type of training is another way to be able to build on the assets that already exist. Oh, that's a good point. So I think maybe Sarita, do you want to like share that, like follow on, on Martine's discussion? Because one of the bigger topics that we have is really community outreach. How do we mobilize these patients from, I think, from patient's perspective? I think I also want to hear Dr. Robertson from physician perspective. How do, you know, we kind of share that um, information to increase awareness so that we have increase in participation. So Sarita, do you want to take that one on? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I think, I think she's spot on. I think, I mean, I think, I think we have to, um, we have to recognize the resources that we have. And um, if, if academic institutions are where the clinical trials are being held um, and, and, and they disseminate that information to you know, practitioners in the community, community physicians, um, that can't be the only way that patients learn about these opportunities, right? Like, like I think we have to, we have to leverage the, the patient advocacy organizations and, and the community health workers, the community leaders, um, um, local churches, you know, that, that have um, a longstanding history within the community. I think we have to leverage 
every possible um, opportunity to get the information to the patient. I think a lot of the challenge is we wait until we need the patients and that that relationship hasn't been built. And so and so now there's an urgency to pull patients into um, into these trials, into these studies, and, and we want their participation. But um, but we haven't we haven't built that foundational relationship in order for patients to trust. And so I think I think Martine is right. I think we have to um, we have to take that community health worker uh, approach and and use every possible um, resource that we can in order for patients to feel um, that there's an opportunity for them to participate. I think too, um, you know, Harsha, you know, just talking about um, making sure patients, and, and I even think Dr. Robertson mentioned it, making sure patients can access um, where these where these trials are taking place. You know, we, we talk about the, the centers of excellence and, and, and those being um, really good starting points, but but Agnes, you're right. A lot of patients aren't going to centers of excellence. Um, and some patients who are, um, myself included, um, we have been denied care from a center of excellence because of our son's rare disease, because of the high mortality rate. Um, and so I think we have to we have to take all accounts into consideration when when we think one way is the way. We have to really have those lived experiences included in those conversations so patients can say, yeah, but that's not going to work for me because I've done I've tried that already and I didn't get a, a positive outcome. And so, um, um, yeah, that's that's my two cents. And I'll, I'll yield for somebody else to to chime in. No, I see Dr. Robertson like nodding her heads a lot. I think she has some some thoughts about that. I, I am. I agree with everything that Sarita just mentioned there, and, and really every and echo all the comments thus far on this topic. Uh, I just wanted to insert one thought, and that is that we need to um, change our healthcare system so that our providers and physicians have time for advocacy and research, um, and that will be a big shift as we're moving to be advocates. You know, there's a big, there's a lot of conversation around physician burnout. And that burnout is also related to the inability to advocate for our patients and to be engaged in more academic research and clinical trials. So if we could make it normalize the concept of there haven't been time, maybe five or 10% of the time um, that physicians and providers have to dedicate towards patient advocacy and, and clinical research systemically, then we would have a larger avenue and more latitude to work with patients and really be proactive versus reactive to um, getting them the additional care and access to clinical trials. No, I think, I think we all hear that, right? I think we all have our physician visit and sometimes we do feel rushed, even if it's the best of physician, because, you know, they have so many things that they need to take care of. They need to take care of their health. Then they need to do all the proper charting. <laughs> um, electro um, medical record can be, um, I guess, um, I would call them a love-hate relationship, right? So it does take off a lot of, I think the administrative take a lot of time so that it's hard for them to build that patient-physician relationship and 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 spend more time on patient advocacy. So I have, an I have a question that just come in that I want to kind of address because Sarita, you mentioned that that your son was denied care in this. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Um, I think the audience was wondering, was he denied access to a clinical trial, access to care? Anything you would have done differently that you would want others to hear um, with that experience or just share learnings? Absolutely. Um, so we were we were denied standard care, not um, we were not denied access to a clinical trial. Um, there there aren't any clinical trials for Edwards syndrome um, to our knowledge. We have not found anything. But uh, due to the high mortality rate associated with Edwards syndrome, um, we were denied just routine health care. We were told to enjoy our time with him that he would pass away soon. And so um, having had four other children, 
prior to him, we we knew to kind of push the narrative and and just ask questions. You know, well, why can't we receive treatment for simple things like jaundice? You know, um, that's that's a routine um, diagnosis that newborn babies are born with. But but again, we were told he would pass away soon. We we understand that five to ten percent of babies born with Edwards syndrome, um, only five to ten percent will live to their first birthday, past their first birthday, but with severe intellectual disability. For us, because he was alive, we wanted care. And, and I, the healthcare system, unfortunately, they look at the science, they look at the, the, the medical statistics. And, and that was the only conversation that, that they were choosing to have with us, um, that he would pass away soon. They sent us home post-delivery and hospice care where we stayed for seven months. And so that really began my efforts of advocacy and public policy. Today, Elijah is five years old and he's in kindergarten. And so I think, I think, I think we have to choose as patients. Um, we have to choose how we respond to what we hear. Um, you know, and, and I think I think it all, again, starts with conversations and communications. Um, we wanted a different outcome for Elijah, which meant we had to, you know, change doctors sometimes. And, and sometimes we had to live with, you know, right now, nobody will see him. Nobody will treat him. But eventually we found a medical team that was willing to, to see him. We we are a rare family, so we do have to commute two hours one way. Um, to see that medical team, but that's something that we're willing to do. And so I think, I think you just, as a patient, you have to choose what you're willing to respond to and how you're willing to respond. And, and that's what we, that's what we chose to do. So, yeah. No, that must have been so heartbreaking to be told that information, right? I, I mm -hmm. and I applaud you for fighting and fighting. Um, it takes a lot of effort and, you know, and I'm glad you do. You did eventually finding a medical care team. Um, then I'm going to ask Hasha to share his experience. I, I think more from a rare disease development perspective. Hearing what Sarita has mentioned, um, what would you? How would you tell patient with rare disease to kind of push for better care? To push for clinic um, sponsors to develop drug in rare diseases especially if it affects, you know, a smaller, um, forgive me for using the word smaller, like diverse, um, smaller minority group or cultural ethnic groups that may, you know, certain genetic disease may affect them disproportionately. How do you tell sponsors or even researchers to say, you know, we need to develop a drug for this condition? From a patient perspective, what can patient do to be a stronger voice? Absolutely. You know, you uh let me put a couple numbers here, Agnes, uh, to uh, answer that question. You know, there is uh, close to 11,000 rare diseases, uh, according to a recent report, right? We, we used to say 7,000 rare diseases, and every year, 250 new rare diseases have been discovered in the recent past, largely due to our ability to diagnose more diseases and genetic testing. And so, uh, but there's only uh, 1,080 or so approved orphan drugs by the US FDA. And uh, that accounts for uh, less than 8% of known rare diseases. So for more than 90% of rare diseases, the best thing that can happen is maybe there is a clinical trial that the patient can enroll in. Uh, that's the, uh, for vast majority of rare diseases, that's the case, right? And so it's very important to educate and inform the patient community in rare disease that you got to pay attention to clinical research and clinical trials uh, if not, at least be part of patient registries and natural history studies for them to even stand a chance at ever being enrolled in a curative clinical trial. That's that's the uh, get in the line and get in the queue. And, and the best thing that can happen is you, you, you get enrolled in a clinical trial. The second is um, in, from a, a diversity and uh, point of view, right? Um, there is a majority of the clinical trial ecosystem is built naturally over the last seven plus decades of randomized controlled clinical trials towards the Western population, English speaking population. Uh, 
And so uh, like Dr. Robertson was mentioning, if you have to do a true informed consent, you, you got to make sure that there is comprehension on the patient side. Uh, and it, it would be unethical to enroll someone who does not understand the risk and benefit of mm -hmm. what they are getting into. And so um, to be able to provide informed consent in multiple languages, to be able to engage and retain, recruit and retain a patient family throughout a clinical study uh, takes trust building that. And, and part of that is communicating to them in the language that they are comfortable with and making sure they comprehend what, what it is. And that means that we have to adopt uh, newer technologies, language translations and interpretations uh, and making sure there is comprehension uh, involved. And that's very critical in building and maintaining that trust throughout the clinical study. Yeah, so thank you for sharing that because you bring up another good point is that, you know, we talk about, you know, patient outreach community, which we, we haven't really addressed some of the actual, the cultural, the language barrier um, in, with, within the US. You know, I'm starting to see more translation in Spanish, um, maybe some translation in Chinese. Um, but overall, the outreach has been, you know, relatively um, limited. Uh, Martine, based on your, you know, public health experience and your expertise, what insights can you share for us so that when we start thinking about designing a campaign, for example, to educate just about clinical trials in general, um, or even just um, general health screening so that we can identify rare disease early. What are some strategies, apart from the, the one that you mentioned, is there anything that we need to consider or what works and what has not worked from a public outreach perspective? Yeah, so I'm thinking about, um, you know, I, I teach students who end up actually working uh, in many cases on um, uh, assisting with clinical trials. And I'm thinking that one of the things that they um, that helps them in their preparation is this concept of cultural humility. And so we've been talking about cultural competency in terms of understanding mm -hmm. the differences uh, between different cultures and um, their perspectives. But a cultural humility perspective also makes us um, listen and understand the perspectives from which people are coming from and also makes us try to identify our own biases. And so that's one step I would say is to um, sort of um, try to, to begin to employ a cultural humility approach where we're getting a concept and understanding of what are, what the, the, the patients are going through. Then I would say that from public health, we have we do have some good examples of some things that work. We have the ability to create um, education and outreach messages that um, come from the ground up. Um, this concept that's known as um, community-based participatory research, we've touched on this too in, in many different ways mm -hmm. in this conversation so far. Um, and that really is recognizing that the people for whom you want to reach, they're the best way to be able to know, how do I reach them? And so to be able to uh, engage them in, as uh, we talked about in an authentic way from the beginning. And then I would say when it comes to the ability to um, maintain that relationship is that um, we also have to, you know, almost come back to that cultural humility piece. How is it that the relationship has changed? What is it that as the person perhaps who is now engaged in this clinical, clinical, clinical trial, what is it that they need? Is it different than what it was in the beginning? And that might mean that I might have to go off my script or off my protocol, but I need to be responsive in that way if I am to continue to get the best kind of data that I can possibly use so that I can actually make this clinical trial worthwhile. I, I see Sarita going like this, and I think everybody agreed. Um, so there's a there's a, a question about you know talking about building on what you said, uh, Martine, about cultural humility and competency. Um, you know, in your role, I'm going to read because I think this is a good one, and um, I don't want to paraphrase. In the role as a professor, what do you teach your students about cultural competency and the heterogeneity of racial and ethnic groups? I think that's a good one, right? There's so many. We talk about the U.S. being a melting pot. There's so many different cultures. And I can see Dr. Robertson kind of like, how do you incorporate all the different diverse group and be respectful? What's your approach? And, and then I would want to hear Dr. Robertson's approach as well. One of our approaches is to, in, their very, in the very first class that they take, Introduction to Public Health, we bring them into 
our local communities and not just bring them in to sort of, you know, observe. Um, we have those local communities identify what their needs are. We have class in their community space. Um, we have our students work with the residents to be able to address the needs in the projects that the students do. And we then, they work with them all the way through the semester and then we present back to them what it is that the students were able to, to complete. So the, one of the things that I would say is you, you can't learn this from a book. You really do have to be able to engage people face to face, you know, next to each other and to really be in their space versus this idea, again, not just being placed within the community, but really being based within the community. Mm -hmm. Dr. Robertson, do you want to share insights as well? Sure. Yes, I agree with everything that Martine said. It's really important to meet people where they are. Um, in my experience in public health, uh, typically whenever there's civil unrest in nearby or neighboring countries, we'll see an influx of, of, of refugees to our area seeking health care. And Really, what we've done is we we have uh, interpreters in our in our workspace that reach out to the various uh, patient populations that find themselves where we are, and we'll invite someone from their team or from their from their from their um, community to come and talk to us about their needs and explain to us the situation. Um, one powerful powerful example was a lunch and learn series we had. Um, for our maternity clinic when we saw an influx of, of Haitian Creole patients come into the area. And our this she was just a community member who wanted to engage because she she herself was Haitian and she understood the situation that they were in and she wanted us to understand so we could offer better care. And we were able to receive the information that she provided to us and it really changed the way that the all of the staff really approach this particular patient population because we had a better understanding of what they were going through. Um, there was more patience when we had to wait for the uh, interpreter to come through and talk to the patients. There was more understanding about um, getting assistance with transportation and making sure they had appropriate housing and, and food um, insecurities were addressed. So again, just meeting patients where they are helps to develop that trust. As Martine mentioned earlier, Patience is key. We that trust doesn't happen immediately. It takes time, and most importantly, it takes consistency. And it also takes consistency across different um, groups of people. Because just because you treat one group of uh, a population one way doesn't mean that another population doesn't observe that and and have take issue with it. So it's being consistent with everyone. And I'm um, no. really speaking out to, to, to find ways to assist them in, in, in more cultural humility and, and competence in competent ways. You know, what I'm hearing from this panel, it's really about what I use, loosely use the term boots on the ground. We have to be in it with the patient on the ground up to really understand and appreciate their cultural differences. Um, and, you know, um, what I call it, maybe genetic basis of the disease. Like there's so many components. There's the cultural component, the um, as well as the the um, the, um, the disease itself. It may impact them differently. Um, I'm just thinking about my personal experiences. Like I I'm a Chinese immigrant. I I and, but I was trained in Canada. And when they needed a translator, sometimes I get pulled in. But what I learned is that translating it's just translating doesn't necessarily address the cultural aspect of the disease or what you're trying to convey to the patient. There is a way of delivering it. It's rather than just a direct translation. So I think I reflect what you mentioned about cultural humility, really understanding. And then when I was trained in Memphis, I worked mostly with African-Americans impacting with rare disease for, that needing transplant. And again, I, I learned that even though the ethnic background and cultural background is different, but you treat them as a patient with respect and you listen. I think that's a really important aspect. I know I'm, I'm the moderator, but I didn't want to throw that in and see if the panelists feel like this is what, you know, kind of like as a summary, you know, this is kind of what I'm listening and hearing is that, you know, there's a patient in front of us. Patients are patients, but, you know, but when we meet with them, we think about, what makes them unique and respect their culture, that ethnicity. But at the end, you know, we're trying to find a solution. 
Um, does that resonate? <laughs> It does resonate. And I'll, I'll say really quickly, that's that's the information that you're not going to get from a textbook. You know what I mean? Like, I think, you know, that's that's why it's so important to to have those conversations, um, you know, those really intimate conversations to understand, you know, like Dr. Robertson and Martin were both speaking to just just seconds ago. Um, that's why it's so important to understand um, perspectives and understand, you know, what this means culturally. For, for me and my family receiving this diagnosis. Um, you know, we, in our prep call, we talked about how some cultures, um, how they view um, healthcare and physicians and the high regard that they put um, practitioners. And so I think those are all things that we have to take into account just as, as much <clears throat> as we have to take into account um, underrepresented communities that may not trust the health healthcare system. So two different perspectives, one with a high regard for the healthcare system, one not so much. And, and, and so I think those are the conversations that you can only learn um, to incorporate into your practice from the patients. You, you just, you're, you're not gonna find that in a textbook anywhere. Yeah. Um, so I have, a, um, I have a question from the um, from the audience directed to Dr. Robertson. Um, who defines and develops the support services provide to patients for clinical trials? So this question I'm going to ask for assistance from um, Harsha, uh, because really it depends on who's designing the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. If it's a public health related clinical trial, then public health will provide the wraparound services to support our patients. If it's an academic center public trial, then they may or may not develop um, those support services. So it really just depends on the originator of the clinical trial and what resources they have. Absolutely, I, I agree. I, I, it, it can, uh, it, it could be a uh, kind of like a relay race or a collaboration between the sponsor, the sites, the uh, contract research organization and patient advocacy group that might be playing different kind of parts of the support services uh, that might be necessary for that particular study. You know, uh, when we need to think even more like very granular, very fine grained when we talk about uh, things like food nutrition, for example, you know, the, there is a variety of diet uh, preferences and even religiously followed uh, in certain communities that they, mm -hmm. they cannot eat red meat or they cannot eat pork or they cannot eat any mm -hmm. meat at all. They are okay with egg, but not other. So you got to be really uh, treat the patients and families without any disrespect for their dietary preferences or just that they have never uh, tried anything else, um, stuff like that. But also uh, many other cultural and religious practices. Um, you know, the, there might be some who uh, do prayers three times a day and, you know, you've got to make a room for a prayer hall and stuff like that. And then they have to step out at ex exactly certain time of the day, etc. So there is religious, uh, dietary, uh, mm -hmm. personal, uh, hyper-personalization. And so depending on the resources of the sponsor, they may want to provide the highest level of patient satisfaction of uh, and the experience of going through a clinical trial as painful as it already is, uh, you know, the commitment of everybody involved to make it least painful uh, is uh, really critical. Yeah, so I can also kind of chime in on that question, having, you know, consult um, a lot for um, companies to develop drugs. And one thing that um, it's a personal mission of mine, and I think working with, I learned that from working with a lot of patient advocacy groups, is that a lot of these patients, they may live far away from an academic center. For them to consider a clinical trial, there's a huge burden associated with it. So what we're pushing for from a sponsor perspective is really understand um, what they need to participate in the clinical trial, provide the level of service. Sarita, I also want to reflect what you said. Some patients want to be competent, some patients don't. So it's working with us, with the individual patients who may be interested in participating, mapping out what services that they need. And we constantly work with the patient as well as the investigator and the research coordinator to say, how do we make it work so that the patient can actually participate in the clinical trial with minimal disruption to their life as possible? Because a lot of times, you know, they have to travel far. The study visits are long um, and they may have to take time off work um, and then they have to think about caregivers. So I think 
we're starting to scratch the surface of this. So one of the trials I'm working with, with um, sponsors that we will offer concierge service. Basically, it's like a travel agent. You call them, they map out everything for you so that the patient can visit the site appropriately. Again, you know, just to make sure they have the level of support. But it all started by, I think, the way we designed this trial was we work with patient advocacy group. We talk to patients. We understand their needs, what works. But we also balance out with, you know, we're not, um, putting too much burden on the site and the, and the patients as well. Um, I think it's, it starts from a partnership. So, um, absolutely. Uh, I'd like to add also Agnes that, uh, mm. all, all great points. Uh, the, the sponsors are also looking to make it easier on patients and families to reduce that travel and logistical burden by taking trial to patients' homes. Now, uh, ability for patients to do a televisit when a in-person visit may not be really necessary. Uh, or remotely from the comfort of their home, uh, that you know, a door-to-door -door travel mm -hmm. can be significant in certain types of diseases, especially if a small aircraft is involved and a wheelchair is involved. Uh, it's not a trivial uh, challenge and barrier. No, absolutely, I, I echo that. That's you know, in some ways, have to thank COVID, right? We can we use more telehealth, we're more adaptive technology, and that's helped streamline some of the visit that can be burdensome. Um, to the patient. So I'm looking at the clock. Let me make sure there's no other outstanding questions. But while we while I'm doing the chat, I want each one of our speakers to think about our conversations today. What are some of the key things for the audience that you want to share? How, what are your from your role? What can we do as a community? We talk a lot about, you know, challenges and things that we face. If there's one thing from your role that you want patients or or um, physicians or investigators to hear, what would it be to help enhance diversity in clinical trials so that we can optimize the outcome and work together to find a cure for for patients with rare disease? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask um, Harsha if you want to go first, um, just to kind of give us your thoughts. Absolutely. You know, one, I will say um, clinical trials are critical and m maybe the best thing that can happen to a patient with rare disease is to enroll in a clinical trial. And two, uh, there is an increasing need to make technology uh, user centric and hyper personalized to not only be able to educate, inform and engage uh, and uh, patients before recruiting them into a clinical study, but also enabling them to complete the entire uh, clinical study uh, using a technology that resonates with their language preference, their cultural calendars and scheduling preferences and all other uh, personal preferences. Uh, that's super critical, especially as we move from this uh, into this new paradigm of more inclusive clinical trials. Wonderful, thank you so much for um... For participating today um, and I'm going to ask um, Sarita if you want to you know give us your last share your last thoughts. Um, quickly I'll say you know for a lot of patients um, caregivers who are navigating a journey you know a child with a life-limiting diagnosis or um, <clears throat> a rare disease critical issue um, a lot of times when it comes to clinical research it's not always about finding a cure. Um, for, for us as a family and even as an organization, um, our priority is quality of life. How do we, how do we create the best quality of life for families um, who are navigating journeys like ours? And so um, I would leave with patient communities, build relationships, um, have conversations. Don't be afraid to, um, to, to go against the, the narrative that you're being, you're being given. Wonderful. Um, Martine? Yeah, quickly, I will just say is that for principal investigators, for research sponsors, you have expertise, you have, you are bringing a lot to the table, but you also have to recognize that the communities that, and the, and the patients that you're looking to be able, with rare diseases that you're looking to be able to engage, they also have expertise, and you have to recognize that it's a, it's an equal um, partnership between you two. Great. And Dr. Robertson? Really quickly for physicians and uh, providers, just remember that in order to advocate for patients who have rare diseases, you have to start with the patient and understand that your relationship is a partnership and you have to meet them where they are in order to know how to best advocate for them. 
Wonderful. I want to take this opportunity to really thank all our panelists for joining today and sharing their insights. Um, I hope the conversation was useful um, to those participating in the audience. Um, I think at this, I also want to thank um, the Rare Disease um, Coalition to allow us to have this opportunity to kind of bring awareness um, to this to what we're facing right now is to enhance diversity um, in participation in clinical trials and rare diseases. So thank you so much for um, joining us today and I look forward to our next session.